As I hold this board marker in my hand, it experiences a gravitational force. You guys remember what a force is, right? In general, a force is defined as a, a push or a pull. Good. We learned that in grade six for the first time, and we've carried that through every year pretty much since grade six. A force is a push or a pull. Specifically, a gravitational force is a pull, a pull of gravity caused by mass. So the Earth's gravity, the mass of the Earth causes gravity, which applies a force. It pulls on the board marker that I'm holding in my hand. You agree with that? No tricks. Like, I'm not trying to trick you into answering something that's not correct. That's true. Okay, the board marker is pulled on by a force of gravity caused by the Earth. What if I take the board marker away? What if I put it away somewhere? It's no longer in the spot that it was. Has gravity disappeared? No, gravity's still there. If the Earth caused gravity, and I take what experienced gravity away, the board marker, I haven't taken away what caused it, then the gravity is still there. But how do we express that? How do we quantify that? There's nothing there anymore to be pushed or pulled. You can't have a force. If a force is defined as a push or a pull, and there's nothing to be pushed, and nothing to be pulled, you can't have a force. So how can we express gravity if there's no force of gravity? Which clearly there isn't because there's no board marker there to be pushed or pulled. This is where we have to introduce the idea of gravitational fields. A force is a push or a pull. A force requires something to be pushed or pulled. You need something to feel the force. But if there isn't something to feel the force, we have to have a way of expressing gravity. We call that gravitational fields. A gravitational field is a region surrounding something with mass, a region surrounding the Earth, let's say, in which a gravitational force could be experienced, a region in which a gravitational force could be experienced by an object with mass, if there's something there to experience it. There doesn't have to be something there to experience it. Look, if I put the board marker in my hand at this spot, this gra the, there is a force of gravity experienced at that board marker. But if I take the board marker away, that doesn't take away the fact that there would be a force there if I put the board marker back. So the field is just that region that surrounds the Earth where there would be a force if there was something there to experience it. This is how we express gravity when there's nothing there, when there's nothing there to experience it. So let's look at the difference between a force and a field here. A force is a push or a pull. In order to have a push or a pull, you need something to cause it. You need the earth, in this case, to cause it. But you also need something to experience it. You also need something to be pushed or pulled. But a field is just that general region in which there would be a force if there was something to feel it, if there was something to experience it. Now, what does a gravitational field look like? I got a circle here that's going to represent the Earth. It doesn't have to be the Earth. It could be any object with a big amount of mass, like the sun or the moon or some other planet, but we'll make it the Earth. There's a gravitational field that surrounds the Earth, and the field lines that are used to represent the field, remember, a region in which there's not necessarily a force of gravity, but there could be a force of gravity if there was something to experience it. These field lines look like this. We also draw little arrows on these field lines pointing toward the object with mass, toward the Earth in this case. Okay, you see these arrows on it. It tells you that gravitational field is a vector field or a scalar field. You're not going to see arrows on it if it's a scalar field, right? Arrows indicate direction. This is a vector field. Gravitational field is a vector field that points toward what causes the, 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 the influence, what causes the force if there was something there to experience a force. Why does it point toward the Earth, or why does it point toward whatever causes it? Well, because if I take the board marker and I drop it, I let it go, it's going to fall toward the Earth. It's going to move toward the Earth. So the field line's direction 
is the direction that that board marker would move if I let it go. A direction of the force of gravity, if there was something to experience the force there. Now, notice a couple things about this. One, the field lines do have a direction, always pointing toward whatever is causing the field. Note as well that in this region, you can see the field lines are a certain distance apart. As we get further and further and further away, the field lines get further apart. The density or proximity of the field lines, how close they are together, is a pretty good representation of how strong the field is. The closer you are to what causes the field, the stronger the gravitational field. That should make sense, right? If we're on the surface of the Earth, gravitational field is a certain amount. Certain amount. It influences or it affects the board marker a certain amount. But if we're, say, a thousand kilometers above the surface, gravity is going to be weaker. It's not going to affect the board marker as much. Now, this is going to tie what we're talking about now to something that we've talked about since almost day one of Physics 20. The gravitational field, this influence of gravity, this region in which a force could be experienced if there's something there to experience it, is equal to 9.81 meters per second squared near the surface of the Earth. In other words, this isn't new. This is what we called on week two of physics 20, the acceleration due to gravity. We're just kind of changing the name of it, providing a little bit better explanation as to why things accelerate due to gravity. Now, it does vary. We say 9.81 near the surface of the Earth. It does vary. Okay, in Vancouver, it's probably a little bit stronger than it would be in Calgary. In Calgary, it's a bit stronger than it would be at the top of Mount Everest because it's further away from the center of the Earth. But on average, the, the acceleration to gravity, or as we now call it, the gravitational field strength, is 9.81 meters per second squared. Do you remember what the other set of units that we sometimes use for gravitational acceleration was? We use it occasionally. Newtons per kilogram. We're going to use that more often now. As we talk about this in the context of field strength, versus acceleration, even though it's the same thing. When we talk about it in this context, we usually use newtons per kilogram, although meters per second squared is still correct. Just you got to be prepared to recognize newtons per kilogram. Now, what if we want to find the value, how, how strong the field strength is? On the surface of the Earth, it's about 9.81. But what about 100 kilometers above the surface? What about, what about uh, 100 kilometers above the surface of the moon. What's the field strength on the moon or the acceleration of the gravity on the moon? There's two equations that we're going to see here. The first one looks like this. G, little g, gravitational field strength, with two little vertical lines around it. What's the vertical lines mean? Yeah, absolute value. Absolute value. So gravitational field is a vector field. There's a direction associated with it. But the equation that we're going to see here doesn't tell us what the direction is. That's fine. We don't need the equation to tell us the direction. We already know the direction. It's toward whatever caused it. We don't need an equation to tell us that. We're smart enough to remember that the field is toward the producer. So this equation is only going to give us the magnitude, how strong the field strength is. Little g is equal to big G. Let's keep those straight, little g and big G. G times m over r squared. Don't get that mixed up with the gravitational force equation, g m1 m2 over r squared. This is just g m over r squared. Now, there's another equation for field strength as well. g is equal to f, the force of gravity, over m again. g, in both cases, stands for gravitational field. But this is the gravitational field strength produced by something. This is the gravitational field strength experienced by something. So if you want to use the example of the Earth and the board marker again, if you want to find the field strength produced by the Earth, you would use the blue equation. 
If you want to find the field strength experienced by the board marker, you would use the green equation. G stands for the constant, right? 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. What do you think M stands for? Mass. Yeah, mass. Mass of what, though? It's important. That's mass. So is this. Two different masses, though. Yeah, Luke? Yes, this is the mass of the producer. Again, if we use that example of the earth and the board marker, this would be the mass of the earth, what's causing the field, versus the green one over here, which would be the mass of the experiencer, which, again, using that example, that would be the mass of the board marker. Mass of the earth in blue, mass of the board marker in green. What are the units, by the way, for mass? We're always going to use kilograms for mass, always. Everything we do, mass is measured in kilograms. If you happen to be given in a question both masses, just make sure you use the right one. Like, don't use the first equation if you're given the mass of the experiencer. Don't plug the mass of the producer into the second equation. It's okay to use either equation. Just make sure you know what mass you're using. Keep it straight. What does R stand for, do you think? Distant, what distance? Yep, the distance from the center of the producer. And that's going to be in meters, right? What do you think F stands for? Sorry, what is it? Yeah, the gravitational force experienced by this board marker, right? If I have the board marker a certain distance above the surface of the Earth, um, M is the mass of the board marker. F is the force of gravity that the board marker feels. We'll say the gravitational force experienced Now, there's another term for the, that, another name for the gravitational force that something experiences. What is it called? I'll wait a second here. I'll, I'll just wait until you guys come up with the answer here. I'll wait, and I'll wait, and I'll wait until you guys can come up with a synonym for the force of gravity here. What is it, Haley? Weight. It's weight. Yeah. The gravitational force experienced... is the same as weight. Not W-A-I-T, though, but W-E-I-G-H-T, weight. Which is measured in newtons, right? The units for gravitational field. Well, we kind of already talked about that, right? Force over mass. Why don't we just say newtons per kilogram? We can say that for the green one as well. Or we could really use, if we wanted to, meters per second squared. Although, meters per second squared is almost obsolete for us now. There's nothing wrong with using it, but in this context, we almost always say newtons per kilogram. Let's take a look at example number five here. It's in your, your handout that you got at the beginning of the unit. Uh, it says, the Earth is a mass of 5.98 times 10 to the 24. Um, we see a little bit of inconsistency with this. In some places, we see it written as 5.97. Some places, we see it written as 5.98. Really, it doesn't matter what you use. I'm going to use 5.98 here because that's what it says in the question. But if you kind of forget and go with 5.97 because you're used to doing that, that's okay. I'll mark both of them correct. It's not a big deal. Anyways, in this question, we say 5.98. The Earth has a radius of 6.37. We want to find out what the gravitational field strength is 400 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Let's draw this out. This is the Earth right here. This is a point where I want to find the field strength, 400 kilometers above the surface. Now, two things here. One, um, we don't want that 400 kilometers. We want the distance from the center of the Earth. So you have to include the 400 kilometers and the radius of the Earth. Does that make sense? Two, the second thing is, it's really a question. 
What do we know more about? What do we know more about? We want to find the field strength right here, at this point, right here. Do we know more about what causes the field or what experiences the field? Yeah, what is it that causes the field here, Haley? The Earth. We know lots about the Earth, the mass of the Earth, the distance from the Earth, the radius of the Earth. We know lots about the Earth, what causes the field. So therefore, let's use that first equation, the producer equation, gm over r squared. We don't know anything about what experiences the field. In fact, we don't even know if anything does experience the field. Question says, what's the field strength at this point? Maybe there's a board marker there. Maybe there's some kind of space shift there with, loaded with aliens. We have no idea. We know nothing about what experiences the field, if anything even does experience the field. So use the producer equation with data from the Earth, the producer. We're going to say 6.67 times 10 negative 11 Newton meter squared per kilogram squared times the mass of the producer. Even if you were given the mass of an experiencer here, we'd still use the mass of the producer in this equation, the mass of the Earth. 5.98 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. We divide that by R squared. And be careful here with R. R is 400,000 meters plus 6.37 times 10 to the 6 meters. That's the radius of the Earth. And make sure you include both, the distance from the center of the Earth to wherever, wherever it is that you're trying to find the field strength. Let's do this on the calculator. Let's say 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. Multiply that by 5.98 times 10 to the 24. Divide that by, now be careful here, okay? Make sure you got some brackets going on at the bottom here. Everything in the bottom is inside brackets. 400,000 plus 6.37 times 10 to the 6, and the bracket squared. See what I'm doing there? I'm not squaring the 6.37, I'm squaring the whole denominator. So the square sign goes outside of the brackets. Do you guys see that? Press enter, gives me a value of 8.70. Does that seem like a reasonable number? 8.70? What is it on the surface of the Earth? About 9.81, 400 kilometers up, 8.7. Yeah, that seems pretty reasonable, right? Do you know the International Space Station orbits at an altitude of about 400 kilometers? It's not that far away. Like, you go on your field trip two weeks from today, we're going to travel to Edmonton as far as we would travel to go to the International Space Station, except that it's just a little bit easier to get to Edmonton than it is to the space station, that's all. Same distance, pretty much. Same distance. It's just it's up in the sky. Gravity in the space station is about 8.7 versus 9.81. It's lower, but it's still significant. Why is it that astronauts float around in the space station? It's contrary to popular belief. It's not because there's no gravity up there. It's because as the astronauts orbit around the Earth, they... Yeah, yeah they're falling. They're falling towards the Earth. They're always falling. But by the time, if this is the Earth, they're falling, they're falling, they're fall But by the time they actually get to the point where they would crash into the Earth, the Earth isn't there. So they continue falling towards the Earth. They continue falling towards the Earth. They continue falling towards the Earth. So they're free falling nonstop. It's like the amusement park ride, those free fall rides, where you free fall for two or three seconds, except they're free falling for six months at a time. So they feel and perceive themselves to be weightless nonstop. Okay, this is a reasonable number, 8.7, even though we think of gravity as being zero at that spot. Let's take a look at example number six here. What's the gravitational field strength at a point on Earth where a 65 kilogram person has a weight of 6.34 times 10 to the six? Haley, I know you know the answer to this next question. Weight is the same thing as what? Force of gravity. So we're given a force of gravity here. What do we know more about? What produces this, this field or what experiences this field? Here's the Earth. Here's a 65 kilogram person. The weight of this person or the force of gravity experienced by this person is 634.4 newtons. What do we know more about, about what experiences the field or what produces the field? Yep. Yes, the person experiences the field. What is the producer, by the way? 
The earth caused it, right? The earth produced the field. We know more about what experiences it here. So let's use the experiencer equation. G is equal to F over M. Let's say F is 634.4, the force of gravity, the weight, divided by the mass of the experiencer. Don't use the mass of the earth, because that's the producer mass. Use the experiencer mass, 65.0 kilograms. When we do this, 634.4 divided by 9, uh, sorry, divided by 65. Gives me a value of 9.76. Actually, it should be 9.8, shouldn't it? Two digits, 9.8 newtons per kilogram. Does that seem like a reasonable answer for the gravitational field strength experienced by this person? Yeah, yeah, like on average on the Earth, it's about 9.81. Could it be as low as 9.76, 9.77? Sure, if you're at a little bit of an altitude, right? We're going to take a look now at worksheet number 24. All of the questions on that worksheet, questions 1 to 10.